Our exhorter has asked us to read in two places in the scriptures today. The first is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. And the second place we'll read is Psalms 91, verses 1 through 9. So, starting at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And again in Psalms, ninety one, verses one through nine. Psalm ninety one, verses one through nine. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, Our exhorter today is our brother, Russ Johnson, and the title of his talk is, for <clears throat> his title is, For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave or forsake you. Brother Russ. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Um, The readings this morning, kind of in my mind, are in contrast to one another. Um, They're almost like an oxymoron in the sense that, on the one hand, Peter's telling us, "Eh, don't be surprised when things happen to you. And, of course, if you're like me, I'm surprised. I, uh, oh, what happened? And then on the other hand, you're hearing uh, from the psalm that was read that God is over us, protecting us this whole time. It seems to me, and sometimes I think to you too, it's like I'm not sure I can't quite figure this out. And we'll talk about someone a little later that had some difficulty figuring it out. And of course, the the title is from Deuteronomy 31.6, For it is the Lord God who goes with you, he will not leave or forsake you. Now, the, one of the reasons I got on this topic was I was talking to my dad, and I really wanted to kind of know about my grandfather, his dad. Didn't know much about him because he died in 1945, and uh, I was uh, not born yet. Neither were any of my siblings. And so I was like, what, what made, made him tick? And the reason I say that is because he's the one that came into the truth in the Rockford area. He'd been on a job with his company in Saginaw, Michigan, and he'd come across some Christadelphians, and he was convinced by them that that was something he needed to get involved with. And interesting, and I'm not going to get into the detail there, but one of the things that my dad said when when they 
were baptized, they needed someone to kind of teach them, um, uh, the kids, because he was just a kid then. That was 1915 and 1916. And so he said, you know, it's kind of funny, just out of like nowhere, there was these two sisters. We, uh, we knew them as Lottie and May Harris. They were half-sisters, actually, same father. But they suddenly appeared into the Rockford area in Loves Park at that time, and they were great Sunday school teachers, as my dad told us. It was, it was amazing what they could tell us. And he said, I, I really think that it was very helpful because it would have been difficult for my dad being that, his, my grandfather being that new into the truth. So suddenly, here is these teachers that kind of come out of nowhere. And I think it literally was kind of from nowhere. They didn't know why they came. But we realize, he realizes now, probably not then, that you know this was all God's purpose. He put this together for him. Now at the same time as we were going through this, he had dr uh, dropped some stuff off with me to kind of look through or saying, hey, I'm going to get rid of this. I don't want it anymore when he moved into his smaller apartment. And one of the things he had was his yearbook from 1941 when he graduated. And I was kind of looking through it, you know, see what was going on and see some pictures of him. And interestingly, a comment was made, you know, like your yearbook staff made a comment. This was, again, 1941. And my brain wasn't really functioning that well, never has for, what, going on 63 years this Friday. <laughs> anyway, one of the comments made by the staff was something like this, Hitler invades what country? Good. And I don't think they meant it to say, good, I'm glad that he did, but uh, I think it probably would have been like something we would have said, like, well, whatever, you know, this is, it's happening, and, you know, what, what's new news now? He invaded another country. But I think the point that I didn't get, and the thing that I started looking at was, um, I didn't really realize that in a very short period of time, actually in less than six months, something was going to happen in 1941 in December. I don't, does anybody know what happened? What happened? Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Their lives were going to get dumped upside down. Probably everybody in his class, and I knew his life was going to get dumped upside down. So here he is, an 18-year-old. And they're, you know, not knowing what's going to happen, um, you know, in their lifetime. But suddenly an event happens in a, just a very few months. And like I said, I didn't really put this together in my own mind, but I'm sure there's other in the others in this room that it greatly affected their life. But suddenly um, this was going to happen. Well, then I asked him, I said, well, did you get drafted right away? Because I knew... Um, he was 18, and like for me, he was 18, they were, they were going to draft him. And he said, no, actually it was 21 at that time, which kind of surprised me. I didn't realize that was the case. So then the next thing that I really realized is I started putting two, to two and together as slow mind that I am. I realized that his brother was going to be convicted of uh, uh, draft dodging. And that was going to happen in just a few years. So before he was probably about the time he was 20, and he wasn't yet draft age, he was going to see that his brother was convicted, and this was going to be in the papers, you know, front line, front page stuff. And so I know that he had difficulties dealing with that. You know, I, I kind of think of Peter right away. Do you, do you know this guy, Jesus? Like, no, I, not that he didn't say he didn't know his brother, but, you know, suddenly you're in the hot seat, and you realize that things change quickly. So there he was probably then 21 when he got drafted, and he told me that, as I was talking about my grandfather, he said as he drove him down to the train station, which came into Chicago for their physical, he said his dad got in a fender bender, and he said he could just tell he was just completely wound up. This whole thing was starting to bother his, his father, the things that had gone on. And um, so my dad then proceeded to tell me he went downtown went through the the draft thing and then he told me after mark draven had given a talk up in wonderland up in uh wisconsin about traveling lightly if you remember that and he was saying my dad told me you know he said i never felt so alone when i was in there i was the only one he said that uh you know said no i'm not going to be drafted the rest of them took off and he was just standing there 
and he said he, he had to find a, uh, the bus to get back home, and it was just a really uh, difficult feeling for him. And then I began to realize, too, then he was 21, that 22 the next year, his father was going to pass away. So all of these things started happening. Bingo, bingo, 18, 20, 21, 22, and uh, a lot of things are happening that were things that he didn't ask to happen, but they happened, and he dealt with them. And then he realized in retrospect, and I'm not going to go into that detail, how that really affected his life. But I was thinking at the same time, I had read an article in 1938, some of you may not, probably not aware, and I wasn't aware for a while, but there was happening in Germany what they called Crystal Night. And some of you probably know what that was all about. So that was just a few years before my dad graduated, late 38, like 39. So that's probably why, well, we don't really know what's going on, but we do know what went on in Crystal Night. And that's when Jews were kicked out of their houses. They were breaking windows. It was probably one of the most terrorizing nights for Jews in their history and what happened to them then. And I was watching, uh, reading some new, um, article I'd seen on the Internet. Uh, it was kind of interesting. It was very interesting to me because at the same time these things were happening, there were four brothers and they were Jewish brothers. Their name was Frieder. They lived in New York, and they had a cigar business. And they decided that their cigar business could be more uh, productive and efficient if they moved it to the Philippines, which at that time was a U.S. territory. And they did move it to the Philippines. And the way they worked it in their family was each one of the brothers would spend a year there and rotate out. And that's how they worked things. But they realized immediately that their brethren in um, Germany were in trouble and they needed to help them. And they had seen how some Jewish people were helped out of Shanghai when the Japanese had attacked and how they'd moved them to Manila. And they thought they could use that as a model to bring the Jewish people out of Germany. So they went with this rotating system and they said that, uh, their, their daughter said that they were quite big poker players. And not that it was big high stakes poker, but they liked to play. They liked to get together. And with them was playing a couple of people. One guy was in, uh, from Indiana, his name was McNutt, and he worked with the government. And he said um, at that time he could help them out because he thought what Hitler was doing was very wrong. But some of you may or may not know at that time that the State Department was pretty anti-Semitic and they weren't taking people in. And he said, let me handle that because I know how to deal with them. Um, just to give you an example, some of you may or may not know of a ship called the St. Louis, which had many Jewish people on it, was heading for um, Canada to help refugee Jews get out. But they were denied access there. They were denied access in the U.S., in Florida. They were denied access in Cuba. And, you know, I think in a sense Hitler decided, well, that, you know, see, nobody wants the Jews. Whereas, just to give you an example, you've probably not heard this, but they tried to get that ship into Manila, into the Philippines, because they wanted those people. They were uh, set to do that, take care of them. Now, at the same time, I thought was kind of interesting, there was a young colonel that worked for MacArthur in the Philippines. Some of you may have heard of him. His name was Dwight Eisenhower. And Dwight Eisenhower, uh, according to, the, to the, the daughters of the Freeders, was extremely good poker player. And he was really organized. And he was so good at that that the Freeders said, we'll pay you $60,000 to come up with a plan to help get the Jewish people out of Germany. And that $60,000 was equivalent to paying somebody a million dollars a year today. He said no. No, he wouldn't do that. Um, he said, and interestingly, this again, this is before 1942. This was in the late 30s. He knew exactly who Hitler was. And I don't know if he had some um, interaction with him through MacArthur or whatever, but 
he described Hitler as the most barbaric person he'd ever known that came up out of the depths. Now remember, at the same time, there were people like Henry Ford and there were people like Charles Lindbergh saying, no, Hitler's a, he's a decent guy. And here we see Dwight Eisenhower saying, no, he's not. He's a horrible person. So they worked together, these three with the brothers, and they worked with the president of the island, a guy named Kizan, and they did whatever they could. And again, this wasn't anything that was politically helpful to them. This wasn't anything that was going to help their businesses. They decided that they needed to do that because it was the thing to do. It was what they ought to do. To them, there was no other alternative but to save these Jews who were being persecuted. Like I said, it could have been very detrimental to their business. It certainly would have been detrimental to their political careers. But they decided that they needed to help these people out. And again, I'm not trying to say that these were people that were true believers. But what I am trying to say is that they were put in place for a reason. And, the re and it happened quickly. And we read in Romans 13, 1, it says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. For authorities that exist have been established by God. So these authorities that were there, they're established by God. They're, they're, not, they're there for a reason. And sometimes it's difficult for us to know that, but it's true. And in this particular case, and that's why I'm bringing these out, these kind of situations that drift a little bit from the mainstream of talking about the Bible. These are things that God makes happen, and they happen in our, in our lives. Now, what was read this morning by our brother Otto was, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Well, again, I just want to reiterate, that that's kind of how we... We look at things. I, I mean, I do. I guess, uh, you know, at, at times our faith is waning. We look at it and say, this is strange. And again, remember, Peter's the one that sat from afar and said, this Galilean, do you know him? No, I don't think I know him. So coming from Peter, to me, is a pretty strong uh, sentiment here. And we know that James, as we were looking at in Sunday school in the first chapter, talks about tests being something that we need to go through. But again, Peter's saying kind of adding another dimension. Don't think, it's, don't think it's unusual to go through these tests, but rejoice in it. So we see these things have to happen, and Hebrews 12, 6 tells us, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. You know, I you read through that and say, how's that? that? Would that be talking about me? Well, yeah, it would. It would be talking about you. And we know it certainly applied to his own son, Jesus, and it applies to us also. And as I was saying earlier, it, it's a difficult at times because it's like on the right hand, you've got one thing, God talking about being tested. On the other side, he's saying, well, uh, I'm there for you. I'm going to be there. Don't worry. And... Uh, I'm going to take a look at the 73rd Psalm. I think I've done this before. And actually, I think if you don't have it marked in your Bible, it's probably a pretty good thing to do because uh, David seems to be stating the things that go in my mind, and I'm assuming yours too. He says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. <coughs> now, again, I want to stop. Remember that David was, what? He was anointed king, right? And I'm thinking that he's saying, hey, I, I thought I was anointed by Samuel, and why, why am I slipping? Why am I having problems? And he goes on to say um, that he was envious of the arrogant. He saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he said in verse 4, for there are no pains in their death and their body is fat. I look at them, he's saying, and I don't see any trouble that they have. They don't seem to be tested like I'm being tested, nor are they plagued like mankind. And he goes on to say in verse 6, therefore pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eyes bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. 
They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore, as people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them, and they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge from the Most High? Does he know what's going on? You know, we talked about the last days in our class, I think, last week. And it's that, that's what you think. I, what God? How, he doesn't even know what's going on here. He said, Behold, these are the wicked and at ease, and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. I'm doing this for nothing, he's saying. And washed my hands in innocence, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. And I have said, I will speak thus. Behold, I should have betrayed the generation of thy children. And verse 16, and when I tried to understand this, it troubled me deeply. I couldn't figure this out. I don't, why is this happening and that happening? I don't get it. And he said he doesn't, didn't get it in verse 17 until he went into the sanctuary of God. That's when I get it. That's when I understand it. And to me, that's when we come together, when we read the Bible. We, you're not going to get it unless you do that, is what he's saying. He said, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you placed them on a slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. So he's saying, hey, it looks like they're on, uh, now I know they're on slippery ground, but just a few verses before, I, was, I couldn't figure that out. I thought everything was great. They didn't have any tests in their life. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors? We know that our brother last week, Mark, talked about 168,000 men suddenly gone swept away, weren't they? And as I'm telling Mark, uh, in Isaiah chapter 30 talks about God being a fire. And some believe that they were consumed by fire as part of what happened to that 168,000. In verse 20, they are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you despise them as fantasies. Like that 168,000 men, they were never there. They're gone. And that's what David figures out. And then also what you, uh, Brother Otto read this morning from the 91st Psalm, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He'll save you, that bird, from being snared. He will cover you with his feathers. Uh, this is a, uh, a model that goes throughout the Bible, an image that he gives us. He puts his feathers and wings around us, and he'll be a, and he'll be a refuge for you. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand might fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. And if you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling. He's saying, we need to say, the Lord is my refuge. It was kind of like our brother Don Davis saying when Jesus asked, can you pray for me with a, an hour with me? And they couldn't do that. You know, he's, David's saying, we need to say, the Lord is our refuge. And he is our, uh, the most high is our dwelling. And verse 11 finally says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. So one of the things I wanted to get to here, I talked about what happens to me, what happens to uh, people that are outside the truth. And, uh, and, and I want to just say with, with Dwight Eisenhower, here's somebody that served two years as president, and he had some issues. But in a, in a sense, I think he lived a really good life after that. And perhaps, uh, this is my opinion now, that that's one of the reasons that he did was because he favored God's people. Um, but what I wanted to get to was, now we talk about Jesus. Now I read through the things that happened with him, and you kind of say to yourself, well, it's really different with him. I mean, he didn't see change like that. It uh, wasn't such a big deal. Or uh, I do. I, I read through that. I, he came in, and it wasn't such a big deal. But we know that um, we read that he had his... Uh, face set. He was resolute. Luke 9, chapter 9 tells us in verse 51. And when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of them on their way. And he entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. So he was ready to go to do what he needed to do to sacrifice. And 
he had prepared himself for this um, in Mark 9 and Luke 9 and Matthew 17. It says, Jesus departed thence and passed through Galilee. And while in Galilee, all wondered at all the things which Jesus did. But while they wondered, Jesus said unto his disciples, so they're seeing these great things happening. And Jesus is saying to them, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be betrayed and delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And on the third day after that he is killed, he shall be raised again. But they understood not. They were like the 73rd Psalm that David said. They didn't get it. And then later on, a little bit later on in Mark 10, Verse 33 said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to their chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. So they're being told. He's telling them exactly what's going to be happening. You know, it's kind of like what I was bringing about earlier. Hitler is invading other countries. Good. Well, it's not good. You know, these things are going to happen. Um, and Brother Don Davies telling us, you need to pray with him an hour. You can't do that. It's too hard. It's, it wasn't too hard. It's the things that we have to do. His disciples didn't understand the ba great change that was going to happen, but Jesus did understand it. They thought he would be king, and he would eventually be king, but not then. And in Matthew uh, 21 and 22 and Mark 11, these different renditions, and, and Luke 19 and John 12. And in John 12, it says, And when the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only on account of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Let's go see this guy, Jesus. He raised Lazarus from the dead. This is something unusual. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus unto death. The priest, we got to kill Lazarus. He's he's he, he's no good for the, for us. He people are believing in Jesus because they saw him raise him from the dead. Uh, because an account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So they they saw Lazarus. Let's believe in Jesus. And the next day, a great crowd had come to the feast and heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of a palm trees trees and went out to meet him, crying, "Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." even the king of Israel. That's what they're saying on that day. Hosanna, the king of Israel. That's what it is on this day. And Jesus found a young ass and sat upon it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king has come sitting on an ass's colt. His disciples did not understand this at first in verse 16, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that he had written of him, and had been done to him. So after he was glorified, then they remembered, oh yeah, that's what was supposed to happen. But we saw these great things going on at that time, and that's what we thought was supposed to happen. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the, out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bear witness. And the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. And the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Look, look at this. We can't do anything. He's going to be king. We can't stop him, which uh, he probably couldn't have been stopped had he wanted to do that. But he realized that wasn't what his father wanted him to do. <coughs> so again, the point I'm trying to make, <coughs> and that it had to have affected Jesus, but he prepared himself for it, was there was about a, a gigantic change that was about to take place from hey, we want to follow you to be king, to crucify him. Crucify him the next day. Hebrews chapter 4.15 reminds us, for we, not, we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he knows what we're going through. He went through this. He went through a 180-degree a, a, a turn that happened. Was there anyone to hover over him at that time like an eagle that was read this morning? Matthew 27 says, Now from the sixth hour darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, 
That is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken this? Forsaken me. And, you know, why would he say this? Well, we talked about this before. He was quoting the 22nd Psalm when that's what it says. He was trying to get those there be, to be interested exactly in what their God had been teaching them through the Psalms, teaching them through the word of God. And in that same 22nd chapter, verse 11 says, Asks, be, uh, ask, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. So he's asking God to be not far from him. And God wasn't. God was there. He didn't abandon him. So when times get difficult, um, we know that things can change quickly, and they can become difficult overnight. And we have to be preparing ourselves, just like Jesus was. Otherwise, we'll wonder, and it's not bad to wonder this, but we're going to wonder, like uh, David did in the 73rd Psalm, why is all this going on? I don't get it. Why was I anointed king and I've got all these problems? I, I, I don't understand. And we come here today, and one of the reasons is we examine ourselves. We need to understand. We need to know what's going on. We need to be ready. We need to understand that those promises that were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, they are going to come to pass, and David's throne is going to be established again with his return. We come here to confirm that belief that, you know, we, we're here, we're confirming that, that that's what we believe. Acts chapter 2 tells us in verse 24, But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope, for thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let the Holy One see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou wilt make me full of gladness with thy presence. So David sees this now. Stephen tells us about it. This is what he is seeing. Actually, I think it's Peter, I'm sorry tells us what he's seeing. And one other thing I wanted to, to, to uh, probably for myself to be aware of too. Second Peter 3 says, for all you must, for all, first of all, you must understand this, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. They deliberately ignore this fact that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago and an earth formed out of water and by means of water and through which the, uh, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So there's a warning that comes from Peter to say, you know, things uh, are, are going to change in the last days. There's going to be scoffing. And I think this is going to be coming from inside the church and I had picked off on a, what I would call a atheist website, um, uh, Richard Dawkins, many of you know, pretty, pretty atheist as they get. And they had pulled a survey together that not they made, that they got out of the UK. Now granted, in the UK it seems as though those following God uh, are, are a lot less. I know some of our brethren observed that saying, you know, it's getting a little bit di different over here. So I guess my point is this, when I look at these, there's just a, a, a lot of items li listed on here. But he says, this is in the UK, not the US, but I don't think the US is too far uh, behind this. So just a third believe, or 32% believe Jesus was physically resurrected, with 18% not believing the resurrection, even in a spiritual sense. Half, 50%, do not think of Jesus as the Son of God with uh, 4% doubting that he ever existed at all. And he talks about, says, as many as half do not think of themselves as religious and less than a third, 30% claim to have strong religious beliefs. You know, I've heard this from some believers that have left because saying, I'm spiritual but not religious. Said one in six or 15 percent admits to having never read the Bible outside a church service, with a further one 
uh, in three or 36 percent, not having done so in the previous three years. The majority, 60 percent, have not read any part of the Bible, independently and from choice, for at least a year. Over a third have never or almost never prayed outside a church service, with a further 6% saying they pray independently and from choice less than once a year. So that adds up to like 40-some percent. 26% uh, they completely believe in the power of prayer, um, with 1 in 5 or 21% saying they either do not really believe it or do not believe it at all. So you've got quite a few that don't believe in the power of prayer. And the final one I'm going to, and there's very many of them, is that ask to select which one statement best describes that being a Christian means to them personally. 40% chose, I try to be a good person. And around 26% chose, it's how I was brought up. So like 50 some percent are like, well, I really don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I think Peter's words to us are indicative that being bombarded by this on a daily basis, and, and, and again, right, to come back to this atheist site, the message is, you know what? You're really not any different than an atheist. You know, that's why they have it on their site. You're not, you're not different than us. So come join us type of thing. And uh, this is what Peter warns us of. You know, we're going to be, the last days are going to be where scoffers start to come out. And Second Peter chapter 3, verse, sends, verse 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We mentioned that last year, the la uh, last week, in the last days. And then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be discovered, dissolved, excuse me, with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. So then in the 12th verse, we're going on to that, he says for us to be waiting for and hastening the coming and the day of the Lord. It seems like an oxymoron here. How can you be waiting and hastening at the same time? But it's what we have to do. We have to wait patiently, and that waiting patiently will hasten the day. And finally, uh, in 2 Peter 3.14, he said, Therefore, beloved, since you wait for these, be zealous to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So we know as we meet today that our Savior understands our needs and he provides them for us. Mark listed last week of deliverance. Yeah, we are delivered from these uh, issues. So we read the word and we understand it just as David did. And we will have peace when we come into the sanctuary. There is so much power in these words that we read that we can look at our life and look at Jesus as we come together at this time as a compass to direct us in our everyday lives.